What was Venice Beach before? This is a time of great division, right? We have father against son, mother against daughter, sibling against sibling, neighbor against neighbor, race against race, gender against gender, nation against nation, don't we? Everywhere we look, millions of refugees are on the move. They're looking for safety. They're looking for peace. Where can they go? It's just like it was for my people, the Jewish people, 70 years ago in World War II, along with millions of gay and lesbians, disabled, Catholics, gypsies, people who had no home anymore. Their homes were gone. And today, meanwhile, the wars continue. How do we create peace? Well, we wanted to find that out too. So 45 years ago, my husband, John Gottman, started doing research on how do couples find peace. He was looking at what are couples doing in conflict? What do they do in order to make peace, in order to walk through the doors of their home with different cultures, different ethnic types, different races, and create peace even when they have conflict? So here's what he did. He brought one couple in at a time into a lab, and he had them sit down, talk about a conflict, something they hadn't resolved yet, and he videotaped them, measured their physiology, heart rate, breathing, and then he analyzed those videotapes one hundredth of a second by hundredth of a second. Isn't that incredible? And he did that for over 3,000 couples. Not only that, but he would bring them back year after year to see what would happen would they change? Would they end up divorcing, or would they end up staying together? And he did that for straight couples, for lesbian and gay couples, for couples who were in poverty, couples who were wealthy, all kinds of couples. So what did he find out? Well, here's the interesting thing. When our daughter was three years old, she's really the wisest person in the family. We ask her for everything. So when she was three years old, we said, what do you think happens with mommies and daddies when they're arguing all the time? And she gave us the most wonderful answer. She said, there are no rainbows in the house. Isn't that, ah, it just was touching to me. And so we thought to ourselves, okay, how do we create more rainbows in the house? So here's what we did. We studied the work of Anatole Rappaport. He came to the United States from Russia, and he became a mathematician. Okay, got a PhD. And then he got a second PhD in social psychology. And what did he study? How do nations make peace? Wow, what a question, right? So he studied diplomats, and he watched who were the most successful negotiators. And he noticed something really interesting. He noticed that what they did was this. One diplomat would be the speaker. The other one would be the listener. And the listener would postpone bringing up his or her point of view until the speaker was finished and that listener had summarized the speaker's point of view to the speaker's satisfaction. Only then would the listener then bring up his or her point of view. Huh, 
Very interesting. So we went back to the lab, and we were watching how do our couples actually argue, the ones who were successful in their relationships. Now, mind you, who knew that successful couples argue all the time? But the reality is, they do. They're just like all the rest of us. As a matter of fact, remember, we were bringing them back year after year. And they would argue about exactly the same thing <laughs> year after year. The only thing that changed was their fashion sense and their hairstyles. That was it. Other than that, it was exactly the same arguments. In fact, we learned, and this was a great relief to me, 69% of all problems are perpetual. Here's why it was a relief. John and I have one of those, of course, right? So here's what ours is. John calls me obsessively compulsively neurotic. <laughs> okay. And he, of course, is charmingly sloppy. <laughs> charmingly is the important word there. And this yarmulke that he wears on his head, this little skull cap that he wears, it's not a skull cap, it's actually a halo. That's what he tells me all the time. <laughs> all right, so let me tell you the facts. The facts are that we have 5,000 books in our house. I'm not kidding. He says, no, we don't. I say, yes, we do. And they're all next to the bed, on his side of the bed. <laughs> so I have to leap over the piles of books, in order to make the bed. All right. So we've been dealing with that problem for the last 30 years. <laughs> they call that perpetual. And hopefully we'll get to deal with it for another 30 years, right? Okay. So here's what we saw. We saw that the listeners did something really interesting, exactly what the diplomats were doing. The really good couples had listeners, when they were dealing with a conflict, who would first just listen, take in what the speaker was saying, and then, only then, after the speaker was finished, they would summarize what they heard the partner say, and then give it a few words of validation. Something like, okay, from your point of view, I can see how you would feel that way. That, that makes perfect sense. I get it. Wow, that was interesting. Then they would bring up their own point of view. That's what the listener did. Hmm. Just like what Rappaport found with his diplomats. Now, the speaker had a very important job, too. So it wasn't just about being a good listener. The speaker had to bring up their point of view about an issue without blame, without criticism, without contempt, without mockery, without sarcasm. They would bring it up first by saying something like, I feel. I'm upset. I feel upset. I feel angry. I feel sad. I feel worried. And they couldn't cheat by saying, I feel that you are an idiot. <laughs> this would not work. Then, after they said what they felt, they would bring up the situation. They wouldn't describe their partner. They would bring up the situation. I'm upset that the kitchen is a mess. I'm worried that the bills haven't been paid on time. Hear the difference? There it is. And then they would finish with, here's what I need. And they would say, here's what I do need. They would tell their partner how their partner could shine for them. They wouldn't say, here's what I don't want you to do, which ends up sounding like criticism, right? So a lot of us have trouble with needs bringing up our own needs, right? We're not supposed to have any needs. We're supposed to be independent. We're supposed to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps, not depend on each other. Well, not true. Biologically, we are pack animals. We will not survive unless we depend on each other. As a matter of fact, if you take an infant and you keep that infant 
well-fed, warm, dry, safe, but you don't touch the infant. Do you know what happens? The infant has a much higher likelihood of dying. They used to call it failure to thrive, but that's what it is. The infant needed human touch, human connection. Well, so do we. We don't outlive that. We still have that. We still need connection. So we have needs. There is no such thing as too needy. How many of us have heard that? Oh, you're too needy. Well, you're not. Your needs are great. They are just fine. So, let's take an example of what this would look like. Let's say your mother-in-law is coming over for dinner tonight, and you're really nervous because she always finds something to criticize you about. Right? <laughs> oh, well, sounds like that's familiar to somebody. Okay, so what's the wrong way to say this? The wrong way to say it is, dear, your mother is a wart on the back of humanity. <laughs> okay, then. Gee, let me help you. You know, what, what response do we expect? Well, instead, here's where you'll get a better response. By making yourself a little more vulnerable, by really telling your partner what you feel. Hey, honey, I'm anxious about your mother coming over tonight. There's the situation, right? Here's the need. Would you please stand by me if she finds something to criticize me for? There's the positive need, how your partner can shine for you. You see? So it's as simple as that. Now, just because you say it perfectly does not mean your partner will agree and say, of course, honey, I'll do anything you want. <laughs> I mean, wouldn't that be sweet, right? So that's where compromise comes in. So let's talk about compromise. When we studied these masters of relationship, here's what we saw them do. With compromise, they would first think about what can I not compromise on? What is so dear to my heart? that if I compromised on it, it would feel like I was giving up the bones of my body. What can I not compromise on? And then they would think about, okay, but I can be more flexible about who does something, when something happens, where it happens, how it happens, how much gets spent. So there was the key to good compromise. People get stuck with compromise when they feel like they have to give up too much. Then they dig in their heels, they don't compromise. But if they feel like that part of the compromise that's so dear to them is actually being honored, then they can be more flexible. They can build a compromise. So, John and I created a method of helping couples deal with compromise, and it looks like this. So, what is this? We call it the two-oval method or the bagel method. So, in the inner circle, here's what we have couples do. Each person takes an, you know, the same issue they're talking about, and they write down in the center circle what they cannot compromise on. It might be a core need, a core value, a dream they have, a priority. And then in the outer circle, they'll write down what they can compromise on. And those tend to be, you know, the questions that maybe a newspaper reporter might ask. When will it happen? How long will it last? Where will it happen? How much will be spent? And so on. And after they've written those out, they share those with one another and then talk about how can we reach a compromise which honors both of our inner circles but then compromises around the outer circles. So let me give you an example of a couple who did this. We had a couple who came to one of our workshops and they were facing retirement. They were very excited about that and they had 
a real big gridlock conflict around what are we going to do after we retire. So here was the gridlock, the big problem. He wanted to sell their house, buy a sailboat, sail into the sunset, right? Classic. Sail around the world. That's really what he wanted to do, a beautiful dream. What did she want to do? Well, she also wanted to sell the house. Okay, that's good, one point. But then she wanted to return to the farm that had been in their family for over a century. And where was it located? Iowa. <laughs> All right. So how do you sail around the world from Iowa? This is not an easy thing to do. So listen to how they built this compromise. So he put in his center circle sailing. And she, of course, put in her center circle, farm. Then, whose dream went first became flexible. How long would it last? Where would they go? How much would they spend? When would it all begin? All of those were flexible. And when they began to talk about their compromise, they came up with this lovely compromise where they would first sell the house and then buy a boat. And they would sail as far as they could go for one year. Then they would put the boat up on dry dock and go live on the farm through all four seasons. After that, they would then compare their experience, compare what they really loved, and make a decision for the next two years. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, so what did John and I do about our charmingly sloppy versus incredibly wonderfully tidy? <laughs> All right, so what do we do? So we've reached a compromise. Here's our compromise. I'll let the books pile up and up and up and up. And when it becomes life-threatening for me to make the bed, <laughs> only then. Will I turn to John and say, John, the books, now. And he gets the idea. And then he cleans up the books beautifully. And I'm so happy. And then they start to pile up again, right? There's our compromise. So we have this lovely kind of cycle of Tidy versus sloppy, tidy versus sloppy. It's good enough. And all we're looking for is the good enough relationship, right? That's what we're looking for, not perfection, but the good enough relationship. And so, with that, I want to just say that can we do this? Is it so complicated? John went into a classroom. And there were third graders in this classroom. They were all eight years old. And he said to them, hey, guys, I want to ask your advice. If a mom and dad is arguing about money, whether they should spend money or save money, what do you think they should do? And this little boy shot his hand up, and he said, me, me. And then he said, spend a little, save a little. Brilliant. So if they can do it, so can we, right? So John and I have been working for eh, about 35 years now on creating more peace in the home, helping couples work through their conflicts and find very different ways of talking about conflicts. And what we're hoping to do is to create more rainbows in the house, just like our daughter spoke about. And if we can create more rainbows in a house, then maybe we can create more rainbows between neighbors, between ethnic groups, between races, between genders, between sexual orientations, maybe even political parties, maybe 
more rainbows between nations. So let's go out and create some peace. Thank you.